After the revolution, Captain Ting was paid with 20,000 acres in the wilderness of Maine. The captain had a vision of a town beside a stream. Where wheels would turn, a man could earn his living and his dreams. They almost called it Harry, but Ting Town came to be. This place we now call Wilson, Maine, has a lot of history. teaching there, I was teaching second and third grades, a little later when they readjusted the grades, I was teaching third and fourth grades. And for 14 years, I taught third and fourth grade, a combination of third and fourth grade, and I loved it. I really, really liked the fourth grade children. I With 20,000 acres in the wilderness of Maine. Wells upon Sandy Hill, whoever lived there till I was 12 or 14. And then they came down and went one year at a well high school they had with them. There was a woman by the name of Jenny Collins that belonged here to Wolverham that taught school. I taught her that. And I came back at years and went to the academy and graduated. Then I went to Farmington at the Donald School. teaching always it was something that that when I played we played school from the time I was uh, able to play at school it was something that I wanted to do and I had teachers that I wanted to be like I taught in the town of Wilton 44 years, and I enjoyed every minute of it, of my experience from early morning till I went home at night. of a community, the provision 
for education was of primary concern when the General Court of Massachusetts stipulated that one sixty-fourth of the land in Tings Township be set aside for a grammar school. It was common practice in those early colonial days to provide education for their children before incorporating as a town. In East Wilton, for example, Mary Fletcher, at the age of 14, taught in Brown's barn before any schools were built. The report is that her pay was 75 cents per week. Later in the century, Leon Mosier's pay at the White Schoolhouse on the Weld Road was $5 a week, out of which he paid 75 cents for board. Following Wilton's incorporation as a town in 1803, those at the first town meeting elected members for the school committee. It was their duty to divide the town into school districts so that units, often known as neighborhoods, could more conveniently handle the details involved in the education of children within normal traveling areas, either afoot or by horse. In 1806, the town fathers voted to increase the 10 districts to 20, each with its own agent, who hired the teacher and raised funds for his district. As to personnel, the agent hired one teacher to instruct all grades. On rare occasions, the teacher could be quite young, sometimes instructing pupils their own age or even older. All too often, teachers were also custodians. Hence, teaching in one-room schools proved challenging on many levels. Some of the older boys attended only the winter term because they were often needed on the farm. In 1804, the first schoolhouse was built in District No. 2. It became known as the Adams District since it was on the corner near the Charles Adams home, now the residence of Leonard and Sylvia Whedon. The building was raised in 1901. Now let's hear about one of those days at school in the early 1850s from one of the pupils. My name is Josh. I am in the third grade, and I go to the Adams School in the back of East Wilton, near the old Hatch Farm. It is made of bricks with only one room, and is called the District School. It is my job this turn to fill the wood box for the big stove in the back of the room. Mr. Ditson, who has the farm up the hill, starts the fire in the cold weather for our teacher, Miss Knowles. First thing in the morning and after recess, all 18 of us boys and girls huddle around the stove before class. Miss Knowles teaches all grades one through eight. That's probably why she's so strict, but often she has a caring smile in her eyes and she makes us mind. She boards in rooms with the greens up the road. This is her third year here. My older brother Sam has the honor of bringing in the water every morning from a well close by. He keeps the wooden bucket full and makes sure the dipper is hanging from it. He also fills the wash basin and hangs a towel under it. Miss Knowles starts school every day with a pledge to the flag. We sing America and then follow with a verse from the Bible. It is read by someone in the eighth grade. This makes us feel right good inside somehow. My desk is in the third row. The little kids sit up front, but they can't have ink walls until they're in the third grade. When they recite, they sit in little chairs in the front of the class. The big kids are lucky because they have double desks in the back of the room. I don't care, though, because it's cold back there. For arithmetic and spelling, we use a kind of a hard crayon. Our teacher calls it a pencil and says it's made out of carbon. The older kids and the teacher use a blackboard for some lessons. I watched my father make one with a blackboard. He sanded down two boards real smooth and then painted them with black paint. At recess, when it's not storming, we play outside. 
I like to play Tucker, a kind of tag game, or in blind man's bluff, or hide and seek. Some boys make whistles on willow stems. Others like to play marbles. Most like to play pass with a ball made out of leather or strips of cloth. The girls like to talk about dolls or new dresses, but sometimes they chase us boys. When the noon bell rings, we get out our lunch baskets. Mine is one of Mom's old lard pails. I usually have biscuits with jam and dried meat, or an apple and a cookie or cake. Sometimes Mom will treat me with pie or Indian pudding. When we have to use the outhouse, we have to raise our hands for permission. Here at school, we call it a back house because it's in the out back of our school. Every once in a while, we have our parents visit school when there is a social. And this is really fun when it's a box social. The men and boys buy the boxes and then eat with those who put up the lunches. Last year, most of the raised money was used to buy pictures of Abe Lincoln and Sir Galahad. With the rest of the money, our teacher bought merit cards for us. We earned them by getting good grades and having good attendance. After we win so many, the teacher gives us a pretty certificate. Mr. Clark is going to vaccinate us today for smallpox. It scares me, but Dad says we have to have it because there is so much sickness around. Dad and Mom have us pray every night at supper that our family doesn't get the pox. We heard just today that little Helen Walker has died. That that makes three from one family in two weeks. Last year, our school lost seven from two other families. Dad says someone has got to find out what's causing the smallpox. I almost forgot to tell you that when one of us kids is very naughty, we are made to sit in the back corner and wear a tall pointed hat with the word dunce on it. But I almost, but it is almost never a girl. Anyway, I like school, and I think most of the kids do, in spite of what they say when school is over. No more pencils, no more books, no more teachers' cross-eyed looks. In the early 1850s, Mr. N. H. Clark was given $20 by the town to vaccinate all the inhabitants. It was at this, this time the, the uh, smallpox was reaching epidemic proportions and many deaths resulted. At this time, uh, hand hewn pine coffins cost from $1.50 to $3, with less for children. because times were so difficult, money was scarce. The Blanchard District School was located at the height of land on the road from East Wilton to Temple on what is now the Don Brown Farm. This road was laid out in August, 1803, thus being the first road authorized after incorporation of the town. The school was built in 1811, being the second school built in the town. The district paid Isaac Brown one dollar for a quit-claim deed to the land. You know, at times, some of the male pupils were older than their teachers. An example, Cyrus N. Blanchard, who as a young man taught at the Averill Farmer school on the east side of Varnum Pond in North Wilton. District number 11 was known as the Hathaway District School. This schoolhouse was located where the road turns to go up to the Alma Hathaway farm, now the residence of Raymond Tibbetts, is located on the right, just beyond the Pond Road. District 
number 16 was the East Wilton Village School. In 1836, Henry Butterfield sold a plot of land beside the church to district number 16 for a building. This was part of lot 126, the so-called bridge lot, and is located just across the drive from the church. The northeast corner of lot 126 was on the Temple Road. From the 1854-1855 town report, report of school committee and financial report. The summer term was taught 12 weeks by Miss Salva Swain. Whole number in attendance, 62. Average number, 53. The winter term was under the instruction of Mr. D.G. Bean of J. and continued 12 weeks. Whole number in attendance, 90. Average, 77. This is our largest school in town. This was a one-room building with a cellar, unusual for that time, and as is apparent, this building was not large enough to accommodate all the scholars. So within a few years, Jeremiah's Walker's house was hired for another room, and this was continued for some time. The house is shown at the right in this picture. The house is located down the street from the church and school and next to the last house before coming to the Temple Road. The land was owned by Thomas Webster and the house was later sold for $100. In 1860, the district bought from Thomas Webster land north and east of the old school lot and a larger school was built for grades six to nine. The north line of this land was the north line of lot 126. The school lot was at a lower level than the 1836 building, but the yards were used for a playground for both schools. When a new school was built in 1928, the grammar school was sold to Frank Blanchard and was torn down. This is a this is a two schoolhouses. It's on uh, what they call Cross Street now in East Wilton. This is a grammar school where the people are standing here, and the primary school is up above, which is still a, still a house that people live in. It. Leslie Neal bought the old schoolhouse and fixed it up for a house, and that's still standing. The old schoolhouse is torn down, and uh, now there's a house trailer by the foundation where that was was setting. This is a sample of writing at the East Wilton Writing School, taken in 1848, courtesy of Donald McKean. Graduating class of East Wilton Grammar School in 1926, reading from left to right, Edna Ellsworth, Helen Costello, the teacher Lillian Webster, Elmo Keyes, and Paul Goodwin. And this is a picture of the East Wilton Grammar School taken either in 1925 and 1926. These are grades 5, 6, 7, and 8. 
and to teach you a little and little stuff. teaching there, I was teaching second and third grades. A little later, when they readjusted the grades, I was teaching third and fourth grades. And for 14 years, I taught third and fourth grade, a combination of third and fourth grade. And I loved it. I really, really liked the fourth grade children. I, the third grade children, I loved them. But the fourth grade children, it seemed to me that they were so responsive. They were almost old, they were old enough so you could talk to them almost in an adult way. And uh, <clears throat> yet they wanted to please you. And uh, they already knew me. We didn't have to spend six weeks in the fall getting reacquainted because they already knew me and they knew what was expected of them. I was considered a very uh, strict disciplinarian. I expected the children to do what they were told to do when they were told to do it. But somewhere or other the children didn't mind that. They they really they really liked it. And uh, I never had uh, any real disciplinary problems. Now of course when I first started teaching school I was on my own. I had no principal. But as time went on it was a principal I could refer the children to. And I never, ever sent a child to the principal's office. And uh, there were one or two that uh, I might have had trouble with, but we managed to uh, work things out between us. And uh, for one thing, the children always knew that uh, they were very important to me. And if it was at all possible, I was on their side. And for another thing, uh, fourth grade boys, uh, have an interesting sense of humor. And uh, I could always go along with that. And uh, if I thought that maybe they were getting a little bit uh, smart, I tried to uh, do them one better. And then they, I remember I was very strict about when I read to them. They had to pay attention if I was going to read. If they didn't, I just stopped reading. And they liked to be read to. And I read to them almost every day. But they had to pay attention, so I insisted that they not be twisting and turning and playing with other things and looking at their books and so forth. So one day I was talking to the children, and I was doing this with my pen as I talked to them. And when I got through, this boy raised his hand and said, uh, well, Mrs. Buchanan, if we can't do things like that when you're talking to us, why can you? <laughs> well. I said, uh, you know, you're right. I never thought of it. And the next time you see me doing that, you just tell me. Not to do it anymore. So if he meant to be smart, he didn't get very far. If he was really concerned, which I don't think he was, uh, I, I helped his concern. That's good psychology. We had an interesting uh, hot lunch program because the lunches were brought down from Walton in steam kettles, and we had a woman come in who helped serve them, but each teacher had to take her turn serving the lunches and uh, doing lunch duty. Uh, I had uh, quite a lot of my own relatives in my room. I had three of my four grandchildren going to school to me, and that uh, can be a difficult situation. We all managed to live through it. Uh, two nephews 
and all kinds of cousins. And of course, I knew the people. East Holton's a small community, and I lived there all my life, and I knew the people very well. And in this case, at least, it was a very good thing. We, we got along beautifully. I had very good cooperation from the parents. And uh, it was 18 years of uh, very, very good time. This is East Holton Elementary School, the day that we were having the Winter Carnival. We had all kinds of uh, events on this day, skiing, snowshoeing, and uh, in the evening we had a, a party we called a carnival ball. We have Alice Stanley, who was a teacher in the primary grades at East Wilton Elementary School in the 60s, with a baby deer. One night um, there was an accident near her home and the mother deer was killed. The game wardens gave Alice permission to bring the fawn to school the next day so that the children could uh, see the fawn, but we had a lesson on um, animals and baby, especially the baby fawn. And it's very interesting and exciting. These are the teachers at the East Wilson Elementary School in 1958. From left to right, Artie Kane, the principal, Edna Buchanan, grades three and four, uh, Maud Corey, grades five and six, Alice Stanley, kindergarten, grades one and two. Artie Kane had grades seven and eight. District number nine, the Wilton Village School. The original building in this district was just beyond the present Methodist Church going from the center of the village. It had two rooms side by side and was made of brick. Mary Bass has written that in the last years of its use, it was in such poor condition that snow blew through the cracks and onto her desk. In the heavy snows of 1869, it collapsed and a new school was built. The minutes of the district meetings were, are available and are proof of the interest and dedication of the directors and residents of that time. After the school was moved into the new Central School in 1903, the Red Men Lodge used it as a hall, and there were Catholic masses there for almost 15 years. Before the present Legion home was built, the Hosmer Edwards Post and Unit used this hall for their meetings. Downstairs was a lockup where tramps were housed and people were held there before being transferred to the county jail. John Nelson also had a print shop on the ground floor. The building was finally removed in 1952 and the lot is now used as parking space by the Methodist Church. Yes. There really was a Wilton High School as early as 1859. As proof, we offer this elaborate program dated November 18, 1859, which was donated to the Wilton Historical Society in 1965. I'm not sure of the exact location of the school, but most likely it was the district number nine school on Main Street near the Methodist Church. This conclusion is drawn from an undated formal graduation photo, and Main Street would seem to be the most likely location. The viewer of this public exhibition program will note that students came from Jay, Canton, Weld, East Dixfield, and Farmington, as well as Wilton. This is the only document we have on a Wilton High School. It goes almost without saying that the Wilton Historical Society would be very much interested in further information on the subject of this 1859 high school. Because many families found it difficult, sometimes impossible to purchase books the state legislature in 1889 passed the free textbook law, 
requiring each town to provide books for its students. The following year, a graded course of study was placed in each schoolhouse throughout the town of Wilton. District number five was known as the Searles School. Located on the south side of the Colby Miller Road, this building is opposite the Keen Morrison Orchard. It had outlived its usefulness as a school and was made into a dwelling which stood until about 1945 when it burned. Colby Miller, have you been, ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. The Miller family brought him. Uh, one time he came into the schoolhouse, I remember, and brought me a, a, a nest no bigger than that, belonged to a, what is it, a hummingbird, hummingbird's nest, but yeah. no bigger round than that. And I was so pleased with that, and we were, we had it on a little branch for a long time. I remember that as a poem, not worth writing down, but it was something that interested me. And we were able to hatch while I was there a, a, a butterfly, a big one, and we hatched them to, well, the children were there, so they saw a monarch come out. Now, what school was this? Still. On the Searle School. Yeah, that little red foot before you get to the golf course, you know. Yeah. Down in there. Down in on that crossroad. Right. And what years did you teach there? I taught there from uh, 1926 until 1940 something. 45, I think it was. What was it? It was interesting to uh, me. In fact, I only got $70 a week. I lived two houses down here, below with my father and mother, and I walked up there fall and spring, unless John Blanchard gave me a ride because he brought, he brought uh, cream to the station and then to sand. And in the winter, my father had a room for a horse in the barn. Some man, man came from Beach Corner and uh, left him in his stable down here. And I took it and drove it up to the house that now the barn where the Morrisons live at across from <laughs> across from the uh, golf course, right? Yeah. yeah. And left it and brought it back. Somewhere along in the road, I started the first lunch program in town. You know, that happened. It was kind of, kind of fun. I was for a teacher's convention, and the, and the government they gave, gave away a lot of food. And I thought it'd be with. I didn't that too bad. And I came home and told Arnold Sandman about it. I said, why don't you see what you can do with it? If I'm not going to put too much on my hair, I'll get you the oil stove. And uh, you take the food that they'll send you, and then you add to it what you need. They, uh, they would always plenty of milk, plenty of those big cans of fruit that they have that came with it, and cheese, and so forth. Well, those children who were there brought their own dinner box, but they always had a dish in it. It was a headphone okay. and took it home, so I had no dishes to wash. And I made a main meal every day up there. And usually I made over oh, 150 cookies on Saturday and Sunday. And I enjoyed doing it. And, he told and the parents were more, <laughs> more than happy. So that was the first lunch program. And One time, we hired a horse and buggy up here to uh, Miller's labor, uh, Miller's uh, delivery stable, and went with a horse wagon, a horse and sleigh over the back. That was a highlight. 
you couldn't get the farms in any other way. No. And they, and you know that democracy is built in rural schools or like that. And if you noticed in the papers that they're going back to put two grades in one room, in a lot of places, they learn so much from the other person and they take care of them. Big boys will be just as careful of those little ones. District number 20 was known as the Knowles School District. This building was the last district school building to be built in town. Going westerly from the Dan Knowles farm, the school was located at the apex of the road where it turns down to go over Piney Brook. Miranda Woodard, who owned a saw and grist mill at the foot of Barnum Pond, built the school in 1855 for a sum of $167.50. It is interesting to note that all 20 of the school districts were in operation in 1855. The school was rebuilt on the same site in 1901. The average attendance of about 12 pupils. It was a typical little red schoolhouse. The teacher standing in front of the little red schoolhouse is Esther Knowles, and later she was to become Mrs. Colby Miller. This is from the 1927 town report as rip, written by Arnold Sanborn. The regular school teams ran as usual with the same people driving them. Arthur Maycumber from his district to East Wilton. Mrs. Guy Pease from Blanchard Hill to East Wilton. And Mrs. Elmer Hathaway from the Hathaway District to Wilton Central School. The only difficulty we had in this man matter was caused by the parents insisting that the school teams drive into their own dooryards and pick up the children, making it unnecessary for children to walk at all. We allowed Elwin Jones one dollar a week transportation for carrying his child to school. They live over two miles from the school. District number four, the Brown Neighborhood District School. This locality was once known as the Brown Neighborhood, but today is called Orchard Drive. The school building was located on the westerly corner of the road leading to the residences of Robert Beatty and Hazen Mayo. One day we had an interesting uh, thing happen when the boys were starting fires and putting them out, and one fire didn't get put out in time. So they came and told us that they had a fire going out there, and we went out and we were fighting it just as hard as we could. And Mr. Salmon came, and we were very glad to see him because he's all grown and some brand sacks and uh, helped us put the fire out. And afterwards he came in and gave the children a little talk. But when he went, he said to me, now don't be too hard on the boy. He's learned his lesson. <laughs> That's teaching. Well, because I was a janitor, too. I uh, was teaching for $11 a week, and it was for 33 weeks. And I got 60 cents extra for doing the janitor work. And that meant keeping the walls clean and uh, the toilets clean and building the fires in the morning. And I really wasn't a very good fire builder. I haven't had to do anything like that. The fire was one of the stalls, was one of those uh, old-fashioned stalls with a tin cover around it. And uh, sometimes the fire didn't burn very well. And when it, supposedly, you uh, kept the door, the outside door closed, and the uh, heat was supposed to radiate through the room. Well, it didn't seem to work that way, so we'd open up the door and we'd all get closer to the fire and keep warm that way. Uh, the children were very good. District number 18 
is on the Walker Hill Road, just beyond the picnic area on Route 2. There were long times when the school was closed, and once for a period of 20 years. However, it was the feeling of the residents that it was better to keep this school in a fair condition than to allow it to fall into decay. This seemed to be the attitude in all districts, and the buildings were shingled and kept in repair in case they were needed at a later date. Lumen H. Gould and Jeanette Butterfield Gould are listed among the early teachers, and they were the parents of the four Gould boys, Rollo being a part of this study. John B. Gould has told his grandsons, Rollo and Waldo Gould, of being the only pupil on Walker Hill. As such, he walked down through the woods to the Hathaway School. This photo is of the original number six schoolhouse. It was located at the intervale on the Well Road, opposite the Manly Green Farm now the residence of Mr. and Mrs. A. S. Hines. The school is now the Franklin Grange Meeting Hall. The school has been referred to as the Intervale School, the North Wilton School, but most commonly known to us as the White Schoolhouse. After the uniting of several school districts, a new school was built on the west side of Coas Brook. Abner Searles deeded the land to the school district for one cent. At this time, district number 13, the Wilkins School, which was located at the end of Tobin Flat Road on the Horace Staples Farm, united with district number six. The White Schoolhouse has been a local landmark for years, and reunions of former pupils and teachers were held here in August for some time. Uh, several families, but there are a lot of children from each of the families. Um, some children brought the lunch to school and a lot failed. And we used to put the pails around the fire, around the stove to keep the dinner warm. Yeah. That was quite interesting. There was more variety of children. I had children in all grades. Uh, we combined subject matter from the various grade levels. And the uh, younger children learned from the older children. Uh, I think that. Um, they came with the idea that um, they would have to behave at school. If they got a spanking at school, they got another one when they got home. And uh, of course the older ones, uh, the younger ones would tell on each other at home. So that made it a little easier. But with um, all grade levels, a uh, few uh, things to do with, except books and the chalkboard. This is district number three, McCrillis Corner District School. The land for this school was sold by Spalding Smith and was a part of the old Maycumber place. The old original Chesterville Road ran from the bridge in East Wilton past the present cemetery through Crocker Town over Maycumber Hill to McCrillis Corner. It was from this road that another road ran northeasterly to the bridge near Frank Beatty's house. The uh, McCrillis Connor School picnic, August 13th, 1912, at Ranges Grove.
is a picture of McCrillish Corner School picnic about 1933 or 34. Sitting in front of the door is Verna Yetten, Howard Yetten's mother. Sitting on the railing is Paul Butterfield, my uncle. Uh, in front of him is my grandmother, Anna Butterfield. Next to her is her friend, Sarah Hardy. The one way to the right is my mother. And then the lady to the left of Verna Yetten. In front of the, in the next row is Mabel Newell. And in front of her is Ed Hardy. On the other railing is Barbara uh, Yetten. As more and more schools closed and a growing population made its demand felt, the need for more grammar schools became apparent. The result was the enlargement of school structure in all three of Wilton's satellite villages, East Dixfield, East Wilton, and Dryden. The land for the Dryden School was purchased from Mary LeGrew Adams $500. The school was built by contractor H.D. Hannon for $3,000 and it was ready for its first pupils for the spring term of 1913. The school building is located on the hill at the corner of Village View and Chandler Street. It is now the property of Mr. Lon Mitchell who has renovated it into apartments. The first class was the spring term of 1913 with 17 pupils registered. The teacher was Susan Holt and she was paid $10 per week. There were two rooms, one having primary and first grade, the other second and third grades. In the later years, near the closing of the school, Mrs. Helen Ellsworth Trask taught the second and third grades and Miss Lucinda Bean was principal and had taught primary and first grades for many years. Another long-term teacher was Mrs. Helen Waldron. She taught the second and third grades for 18 years. Uh, now let's hear from Mrs. Helen Waldron. Tell you another thing. Bible stories and prayer when they were taken to the school was all the prayer, all the religion that the children got. I mean, it simply meant reading a Bible story, maybe a page out of a book, saying the Lord's Prayer, and that was it. And then Pledge Allegiance, we were ready to go. I cannot imagine teaching school where children could talk if they wanted to talk back to the teacher. District number 15 was known as the East Dixfield Village School. The first school, built about 1830, was on the Dixfield side and was used for quite some time. Needing a better building and more playground, a lot was bought from Jonathan Gooch, who had acquired it of Nathan Hall. This was in 1860. Dixfield paid $20 and Wilton paid 15. The lot was just east of the University's church on the Wilton side of the line. 
new building providing for the needs of the time was built, and more land was added later. This old building was moved down the street next to the Grange Hall and made into a dwelling. After the district school complex was discarded, a large two-room school was built in 1915, and modern toilets with a drilled well were added later, making this an up-to-date building. School was held here until 1963, when consolidation came in, with the Dixfield students going to Dixfield and the Wilton students to Seb 9. The first kindergarten was at the old mill, Willard Mill, which was, which then became the community building, and from there it was turned into a, a scout hall and a theater, and also now it is a Dick's store. In the parking lot of the store, was where the a room where they had the kindergarten class. In back of it was a sort of a wet place and the little brook that ran down to the to the river that followed to the town. In this little room there were homemade tables with little drawers where Children could sit. These were made by Bill Horrocks, a person who had lived in the community. The school was used for approximately uh, 13 years. Then we moved up to the new kindergarten building, up in right near the central school. That was a beautiful building, and. We look forward to many years in it. Well, I love children, and I could see an advancement that I was teaching them something, and that was a enjoyment to me to find out that they were learning to read, learning to figure, learning to write, learning to be polite, and you could see all the advancements that they were making. So I knew that I was teaching something. And they loved Don Jay. Right, they loved him. Yeah. And we had uh, lessons in etiquette on the bus to be polite. And he told me once, well, I guess you taught them all right. And I said, why? And he said, well, when they go off now, they say, thank you, Mr. Shea. Thank you, Mr. Shea. <laughs>
we, were, the housing group. we had a unit on transportation and uh, modes of transportation, cars, trains, and uh, when I found out that so many children had never had a ride on a train, we started in to investigate about a trip. And they gave us permission, and we left Wilton to say at 9 o'clock at such a time on the train. And then we visited the different historical and interesting places here in Farmington. And then uh, uh, after a while, they were entertained at the uh, Mallard School for third grade. My grade was entertained by them. And then the third grade at the Mallet School came to Wilton, so as to get a train ride and a bus ride, and we entertained them once a year. One well, time. it was an experience for the children from the minute they left uh, the uh, Central School, or the primary school, to go and buy their tickets at Dryden and uh, hold it and take care of it until the conductor collected it. And this was all an experience of the children. There was an opportunity in Walton to teach at the first grade in the new primary, new, in a new primary school. The, um, to me, that seemed like a great adventure to think that now I'm only going to have one grade and it's going to be fun. But I soon found that there were problems. <laughs> there were bus children coming in from outside because they had closed the uh, more rural schools at that time. So we had bus duties. We had uh, lunch duty in the cafeteria. And uh, we had discipline problems. And uh, we, um, in those days, all the children stayed in the classroom, whether they were slow learners or handicapped, so we had to deal with their problems as well as the teaching the other children. The uh, discipline problems, we didn't, um, we usually took care of them ourselves, but we could send to the uh, principal when necessary, which was occasional. I remember one year I was especially interested in the group of children that I had in science. And we uh, learned about trees, the different kind of trees, and we learned about the, uh, many other things in the environment. So we decided we would have a, a um, science show. And we asked um, Foster Sandman to come up and be the judge to see who had the best, uh, pro uh, best uh, project. I had sent home notes to the parents so that they knew what we were planning to do and uh, suggested ideas that they might help their children with. And it really was very successful. Uh, Foster didn't um, say that there was any one person won a prize because they all did so well. And I was especially interested in that. many years at Wilden in the sub-primary. I was very pleased to go in for two weeks to substitute. My two weeks ended and I, the teacher had been assigned to another grade and Neil Sullivan was very anxious that I take the position which I had been filling. Therefore I went in to, substitute, to teach and was there for 29 years. The first thing was our opening exercises in the morning, which to me was the starting of the day. The children would remain uh, in their seats and it would, we would have the quiet time with our poems, songs, flag salute, prayers, and many finger plays. It was an enjoyable time. Then followed the, the time when we would go to the blackboard. This was a learning time. 
but they didn't think of it as such. It was more play. But the things that we did at the blackboard were all meaningful. And many children participated, usually all of them, because our blackboards were large enough so that uh, it, many, as much as eight or ten, could participate. Uh, then followed a little time of relaxation, and we went back and started our workbooks, which then was a very uh, interesting book and I thought proved very valuable. And they were all uh, corrected and uh, at the end of the uh, time which they used them, they were all sent home. It was a time to, to uh, think of the child and what he had missed or had missed. From the workbooks we usually had another little relaxation and Possibly it was time for them to uh, go outside for a few minutes. Then on coming back, we would have our exercises which pertain to things that would start them in beginning reading. In that day, we used the Dick and Jane books, which were very nice. And each child, during the time that we uh, were there, we worked on the, the uh, books and their, what they contained, and all the little things that helped them learn through not just the phonics. In, that, in those days, the teachers learned many different ways to teach children how to read. One child will not always learn the same as another and the teacher should be prepared to fill in on the different ways of teaching them. Later, when it was uh, in the day, we had our lunch program. And the, as we had a little laboratory and plush in our room, the children would always go to the there and wash their hands afterwards before we had our milk or crackers. Sometimes uh, we would have juice, it varied. Then came the time at about 11 o'clock when they were ready to go home. They'd had a fine day at school. We had all enjoyed each other, no fights. The, uh, always I would say, see you tomorrow, we're going to do something special. Who should come in but Miss Bonsley, our health nurse, which was a delightful person. She had slips to send home for the immunizations and, the, which the, and shots which the children should have, which were regular now. They were sent home to be signed by the parents, and when they returned on some special day, Dr. Sickle, or whatever doctor would have time to give, would come to the school and give the shots along with some special nurses. Leah Peterson was our music teacher and came every week. The children loved her dearly. She has just passed away on West and up until her death she was very active in activities pertaining to the music that she loved. Following her was Mrs. Ogilvy, which we enjoyed very much also. And she was a lady who lived in our town with children that I had had in school. Very nice and very nice ideas. We had our little uh, music band with the rhythm sticks, which were homemade rhythm sticks along with the little drums and things that I had learned to make at the normal school. Don Shea was the man that had the first bus here in Wilton. And it was a homemade bus with, with uh, seats on each side. I don't remember, but he, they had special names for it. But that was the first bus. It was painted a grayish blue. I'll never forget it. And uh, then came the big buses and uh, those that we could go on trips with.
a funny person. As I said, Neil Sullivan was the, uh, uh, pr uh, the superintendent, but he didn't remain long. And then uh, there were several in between, and then Gerald Cushing came. I don't know how he ever done it, but he had so many schools to go to, Dryden, East Wilton, East Dixfield, and Jay. But he always came every, every day to the building. And one day I remember he was running down over the bank, the wind was blowing, his, uh, his coattail was flying, and he was going down to the other school. I always remembered how he got to so many places and knew, he always knew what was taking place. In the latter part of my teaching, of course, we never saw the superintendent. I think once in a while he would just bring one to the door to show them the room or something. But as far as knowing what was happening, and uh, I think that the school board in the old days of the one-room schoolhouse, they always visited. They checked right up on you. And the superintendent in the wintertime, once in a while he'd come with one of those uh, things that had the legs on it, the snowmobile like it was one of them, or he would come with his horse sometimes. With the close of the 1800s, the system of district schools gave way to larger schools housing multiple grades. An example is the Wilton Central School, which opened in 1903 with four grades, each with its own room and teacher. To meet the growing population, four more rooms were added in 1917. This provided all eight grades in one building until 1950, when the primary school was opened to primary through third grade pupils. came and taught in the old central school, the second grade. And at that time, the teachers on the ground floor, we had a great time, Eleanor Mitchell and Ella Roberts, and Peggy Bentley came with me. She was in my class, and she had the first grade. So it was a wonderful introduction to teaching, and I've been very grateful ever since. And mail delivery in Wilton. the students down and lined them up along the edge of the of the lake and I expected to hear plop 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 but anyway everything was perfectly fine. No casualties. But it was such a thrill to see that plane come in and have the first airmail delivery in Wilton. My husband was on the plane too, so that made it extra special for me. He rode in with the pilot. But we didn't take as many field trips as they do now. But always, they always connected with units that we did. And I know one special one that Peggy took, you took every spring, I always did a unit, and uh, then we went to Fort Weston to, to uh, go through the museum down there at Fort Weston. <coughs> but uh, it seems now they go on a lot of, of course I'm sure they probably are connected with their school work too. But we went fortunate. Seven and a half for 
Central School. Who was in there? Looking upward to the second floor. This shows the racks for rubbers, lunches, books, umbrellas. This circular window at the top of the stairs shows a part of the side of the building. This shows Rollo Gould. Another view of Rollo Gould contemplating a very historic past. One of the rooms in the Central School, very likely the room of the principal, Foster Sandman. It is, at the left is Evelyn Smith, who taught first grade in this building when she was beginning her teaching career. And at the right is Ella Roberts, one of the more recent teachers. Wilton Central School, dedication of flagpole about 1914, Memorial Day. It's the graduation of the eighth grade from the Central School. The teacher is Foster Sandler. This is December 1969 in the Wilton Central School, and this is the class of one of the classes of uh, this is Edna Buchanan. Only this is only a portion of the class. In January 1963. The Wilton Junior High School was opened to house the 7th and 8th grades. Soon afterwards, it was named the Gerald D. Cushing Elementary School. I was at the Central School for one year. I was at the Cushing School for three years. I had real good people to teach with. Daddy and Albert Richard. Trudy Dawson, Johnny Backus, and uh, it's very nice. We now come to the end of an era as provided by Rollo Gould and Lauriston Noyce.
in their publication on the district schools of Wilton. We must also admire the willingness of the citizens of each district to provide for schools. From the very first in 1804, when Samuel Butterfield and Joseph Webster joined District Number 2, although living outside, the people wanted their children to have the right to attend schools. When we look back upon the caliber of the men and women these schools produced, we must realize the capable work done by the teachers as well as the sacrifices of the citizens. We should be, and we are, very proud of our heritage. After the revolution, Captain King was paid with 20,000 acres in the wilderness of Maine. The captain had a vision of a town beside a stream. Wheels would turn, a man could earn his living and his dreams. They almost called it Harry, but Ting Town came to be. This place we now call Wilson, Maine, has a lot of history. 